I'm trying to get the right time. What did I say it was? A P. Well, it was the first, first jet that the Air Force had, anyway. Uh, and, uh, and uh, which carrier were you guys flying off of? Oh, we weren't flying off any carriers then. Okay, sure. This was <coughs> down at uh, Eglin Field and, and the, the other Lawson, Lawson Air Force Base. It was the first one. Then we went to Eglin. Then I flew out to, out to March down in Southern California. And, uh, and I finally went home. But <coughs> so I. I already had maybe 30 hours more than anybody else in the squadron of jet time, simply because I stayed with the Air Force that long. And we were, we were in trouble all January and February trying to get flight time. And uh, it was, uh, it was really, really hard, and uh, and then see that was forty, we're forty, forty-eight by then. In March, in March of forty-eight, they decided we all ought to be carrier qualified. <coughs> well. We got a, and we were starting to get some more airplanes in. I, I made, I made ter several trips out to St. Louis to the factory and ferried, ferried new planes back to Quonset Point, uh, just as a way of picking up some flight time. And uh, so they got us a carrier. Carrier was the, the. Uh, Saipan, which was a CVL. <coughs> we weren't too too hot about landing on a CVL in the first place. We would rather have had a, a large deck carrier. But they said, too bad. This is all you got. So we went out aboard the carrier in the first, first day <coughs> car calls. The CEO of the squadron said, I want you to come with me up on the, on the island and watch these landings. He, he chose me because I had more carrier landings than anybody else in the squadron. And uh, so, <coughs> uh, and a lot more recent than theirs too, because of the squadron I left. And uh, <clears throat> so we got up there and they put six guys out. And the LSOs had been giving us field carrier landing practice and, and the LSOs didn't know anything about the airplane either anymore. They didn't know as much as we did. And uh, <clears throat> they telling telling people how to land it and, and and, and it had tricycle landing gear, and none of us had ever flown tricycle landing gear. Most of us never, and, and all of us, none of us had ever flown on board ship. <coughs> um, the LSOs uh, were of the opinion that, that you, when you landed, you had to get the nose over so that and they had a rigged up a way to, for the barrier to come up and catch you in case of emergency, which involved the nose wheel. And would pick up a, a line that would stretch out and that would jerk a cable up off the deck, which would, would catch the main gear and stop you. And, uh, when you land, you want to get that nose over on that deck so you make sure you engage that barrier 
if if you don't get a if you don't get a, a hook hook up on the on a regular wire, and I argued with them. I said, "You got it backwards." I said, "Yeah, the object is not to land and hit the barrier; it's to land and catch a wire. And then if you don't, then you catch it." Get the barrier. Oh, couldn't convince these these guys. They 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 never landed in them. Go ahead and show us what the models. Uh, tricycle gear either. A little bit better. They, show us they were landing on their own faulty theories. Well, this first day up there, these first six guys are all experienced pilots. It was sad. They were coming in, they'd, they'd land and they'd push their nose over and they'd, they'd come up the deck like this. Their main gear wouldn't even be on the deck. The only thing touching the flight deck was the nose wheel until it ran out of speed and then it would come down. The tail hook was waving this high off the deck as they were coming up. <laughs> I think there were. I think every one of them hit the barrier at least once. <clears throat> and I told the CO, I said, come, they're, they're just not landing that thing properly. I said, <clears throat> it should be landed just the same way you, you land a Corsair or a Bearcat or a Hellcat. And so there's, I'm going to jump in here real quick. Go ahead and show us what the model, sometimes it just highlights a little bit better. Show us one more time the correct way, even though that's the help. Oh, oh well, the, course, the correct way is, according to me, was you land and you try to land them pretty much three point. And your tail hook is back here. And as long as the tail is on the deck, the tail hook is going to be on the deck. And you, you catch, a hook might bounce once or twice, but sooner or later it's going to be there and c grab a wire. The way the LSOs wanted us to land was uh, like this, push over so that you engage the barrier up here. Well, the, the tail of the airplane would be this high off the deck. The tail hook would be waving in the breeze two or three feet off the deck and was uh, so it was so obviously wrong. And, and I told the skipper, I said, that, that, no way to land that damned airplane. And land it, you put the gear, put the, the, the tail hook down there where the, where the wires are so it'll catch one. And you won't have all this problem of running into the barrier. And so, Finally, they kept all these guys aboard, and, and he turned to me and he says, all right, you are going to be on the next flight, and we'll see if your theory is correct. You're, you get up there and show us how you would do it. So uh, six of us more went up there, and, and uh, I, went on, I made six, six approaches and made made six, six landings, and they, they, it was obvious that that was a way to do it. And uh, <coughs> I got through, and, and uh, it was a Captain John Cromlin was aboard. He was the first CO of the Saipan, which we were on. And, the time he was chief of staff of the operational test and evaluation uh, force in the Atlantic, and they they controlled the uh, Saipan, and he grabbed me. I was on. They wanted all the pilots down in the wardroom. He grabbed me on the way, and he says, "Diz, you're the only one that knows how to land that damned airplane." He says, I want you to get up there in, in the wardroom and, and tell them how, you, how to do it. I said, yes, sir. 
Well, I did. I told them how I would do it and, and why and everything. And we went back out. Everybody came in and, and landed the way they knew how to land. A Hellcat or a Bearcat or, or a Wildcat or, or, or a Corsair. They all land the same. And, uh, and in just a couple of days, we had everybody qualified. No, no problem. This is the point in which the Navy realized that Diz was too valuable to be an ace fighter pilot. They had bigger plans for you. We only have about five more minutes, Diz, but go ahead and just keep telling the story from there for five more minutes, but thank you. <coughs> well, I ended up with more flight time in the Phantom than anybody else, I think, in the world. <coughs> we, <coughs> we also had orders from Com Navier Lamp who, who said he wanted one or two airplanes out every weekend to go to the different reserve bases like Philadelphia and Akron and Detroit and Chicago and so on. Fly on Friday to get over there to the reserve bases. Saturday morning, give a briefing to all the reserves that work on Saturday. Tell them all about the, the jets. <coughs> and then put on a little air show for them and tell them, show them how it flies. And then on Sunday, they'd have a new, they, they had two groups, one would be there on Saturday and one group on Sunday. Sunday, do the same thing. And then when, when you finish with that, well, pack up and fly back to Quonset Point. Well, I volunteer to do that every weekend. And, and uh, most of the guys didn't want to do it. Uh, <coughs> I, thought, so I, I hesitate to interrupt, but I'm gonna do it. Uh, I wanna hear this story, but it, I don't wanna wait till next time. And you did tell us a little bit about kind of starting up the engines <coughs> on the jets at first and things like that. Uh, we might hear that one again, but you gotta tell me how in the world did you get involved with this air race? Was that in the 40s? Tell us about the air race and then we'll wrap it up for today. Is that okay, Diz? Oh, all right. Thank you, sir. Well, that was, uh, the, air, the air race was in 49. By then, we had gotten rid of all of our Phantoms and we were flying Banshees. <clears throat> we had just gotten them, really. Hardly had any time in them. Well, the national air races were coming up, which in those days was, were, were always held in, in Cleveland. <clears throat> and somebody, somewhere, got the idea that they ought to have a, a race with Navy planes, decided to call it the uh, jet carrier race. <coughs> so they wanted four pilots. They picked four pilots out of our squadron. I happen to be one of them. <coughs> so we flew up to the carrier Midway, and it was in Norfolk. Went aboard and went out went out to sea, and we uh, we were told what we're doing. We're going to take off from the midway. Uh, we would rendezvous in formation, cross the flight deck, going west, and we would start the clock, and we would individually go our ways and until we got to Cleveland. First guy there was a winner. And uh, so the four of us, we each, each 